Hi everyone, welcome to the Inner Game of Change podcast, where we focus on exploring the multi-layers of managing organizational change effectively. Our guests cover a diverse number of critical topics to enable change adoption, including communication, leadership, training, change practice, process design, change capability, and much more. My name is Ali Jama. In this podcast, I'm joined by Fabio Oliveira to discuss another lever for effective change, smart and intelligent process design. With extensive experience in process design and innovation, Fabio Oliveira is the director of innovation at WorkSafe Victoria and is a great mind when it comes to how critical process design is to successful organizational change. Fabio, good to meet you here. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me, Ali. Um, Fabio, um, what I want to cover in this podcast is everything around process design, um, innovation, process improvement. I'm going to use them interchangeably, but perhaps you can educate me on those things. And I want to have um, an understanding how the design of process plays an, a major part in how we adopt a change. Um so um, um, talk to us in general, uh, Fabio, when we talk about innovation or process improvement, uh, what exactly are we talking about here? I think it's a, a very interesting uh, space uh, that sometimes get, um, ha- well, actually you have blurred lines between what innovation and continuous improvement and process improvement is. Uh, from my experience, what I, uh, after working with process improvement, continuous improvement, and more recently innovation, uh, I think there's some fundamentals that you have to follow for any of the initiatives that you're working, that you want to create change. Mm. And usually uh, those fundamentals, they are not so straightforward. If you come from, a let's say, an industrial age paradigm where uh, you are basically treating change as a mechanical thing, as, a, you know, putting in a new machine in a factory and you don't think too much about the people. Yeah. In, in the world that we're living in now, I think the innovation process improvement and, and, and continuous improvement, it's about people. So those, I think this is the key similarity. And working with people is not something that happens very often. From, from your experience, design thinking, um, where does the process process design start? Is it, does it start because we want to solve a problem or we see an opportunity or can you, can you talk to us more about it? Yeah, I think that the uh, process, process improvement and process design, uh, it should be a byproduct of an opportunity that you're trying to explore. Uh, in my experience, we, you know, in the past, uh, the decision to go for process improvement is basically looking at a problem space and trying to find what's the best uh, way that you can solve that problem. It could be by changing an internal process, but it could also be a, a new marketing channel or a new piece of communication. Usually, uh, if, of course, if you're looking at organizations that rely a lot on a lot of, uh, you know, for example, manufacturing organizations or even uh, services organizations that rely a lot on, on, on on people to, to get the work done. There's a lot of opportunity in the redesigning process, mm-hmm. but it starts fundamentally with that challenge on, you know, do you need to get um, better customer experience or do you need to get more profits or more sales? Uh, that's the starting point. I think that every time that you start with, let's just redesign this process, you're probably going to end up like um, having to rethink halfway through the project. Yes. Yeah, so process design should not really be uh, in a vacuum, should be connected to an opportunity or a problem um, and um, and as you mentioned before it's going to have to be a people centered um, activity right yeah yeah a hundred percent we we the world that we're living now uh, you might think that not much has changed inside the organization but everything has changed outside mm. And you have to recognize that this is a dynamic that the people that you're working with are exposed to outside, like, like you and me, you, we are both uh, exposed to a different reality. And that means that people are not so uh, used to being 
pushed around. Uh, they, they have their voice. They know they have their voice. And, and primarily, what you want to do is to make sure that the future state that you're designing is desirable by the people that are going to be going through that process. The same way that you're doing that with uh, an app or a new product, mm. you want to make sure that the people that are going to be running the process also want to do that uh, that new process. Yes, and it's, it's a great point that you're mentioning that, uh, yeah, I completely agree. I think I think there's far more, far higher expectations from employees or people now that any change that is rolled out by an organization uh, is going to have to take their voice into consideration. Uh, not only their voice, their capabilities, the culture, the system, because you can design a whole process um, but then the system is not going to be able to actually, um, um, you know, um, encompass that that particular process. Um, and also, don't forget that there is another part of why we design a process. Um, we design it so then our people can actually adopt it easily with all the support of the change management, training, communication, and all of those things, so that our people can serve our customers. Is that how that process works? Yeah, exactly. And you mentioned design thinking before, and there's uh, three pillars when you go back to, you know, let's say the theory on design thinking. Uh, the first one is empathy, which is putting yourself, yourself on the shoes of the people that you're designing for. So you, you can't design, let's use process design to explain how design thinking could work. Mm. So you can't design a process sitting back in, in the head office. Yeah. You've got to go and, you know, uh, understand and feel the pain yourself. The second one is um, co-creation, which is not, again, not designing and, and pushing whatever design to the people that you're working with. You have got to design with them. And I talk a lot about the everyday experts. Like you might know the theory, but the everyday experts know the reality and, and what's happening. So you have to bring them along. And the third pillar is experimentation. You want to make sure that you start small and you expose the new process to reality reality as soon as possible, even if you know it's not going to work, but you want to learn as soon as possible. So if you adopt those three principles, you've got to, you're putting people at the center. Yes. Okay. Um, the three elements. Um, how does it, how does this, those principles marry with the, with the expectations that nowadays we work in an agile environment, we need to have the minimal viable product and get it out there. Um, so how do we marry the two? Because sometimes Loss of co-creation takes time. Yeah, I think that it's, um, it's not seeing those three principles as separate things. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, I was working in an organization before and we were redesigning uh, a process which was fundamentally a, a highly operational process on uh, filling shelves and, and, and like heavy, heavy operation. What we did is that we designed the process and put that into practice in one day. So we, someone had an idea, we went back and designed design how this could work mm. and we started implementing it in the first day that we designed that means that we got the feedback straight away the people that designed were there to see it and of course that didn't work <laughs> of course we yes. had to change it yeah. but we got the let's say the MV, mvp in this case the minimum viable process running and learning from it and we were of course ready to stop if things were not working okay some other uh, processes are more critical and you, you know if you're a dealing with if you're in a hospital or dealing with people's lives you, you might not be able to put it into practice but you can prototype it straight away yep, yep. And learn from it yes yes um fabio how does design thinking play a role in helping an organization adopt the change i think that it becomes um the uh the when, when you have a people-centric approach to change it means that the change is not coming from the top uh, the origination of maybe the knowing where the problem problem is and you know looking at the results might come from the top a more strategic perspective but when you design with people there's a few things that you get as a benefit the first one is um, you know when you roll that out to uh, to the rest of the business people will know that it was designed by their peers mm. so that in itself is a big change the second one is the language that you this this new project process product will have is a language that it resonates with people as well because you're not creating those uh, you know bureaucratic kind of safe terms people will call it what it is yeah and and then you can rely on the expertise that the, on, from the people that design to actually implement it and there's nothing better than someone 
from a you know that specific part of the let's say manufacturing plant that implemented that process or a, a process in a bank to come in and roll that out to the peers yes um does design thinking or process design does does it take in consideration how complex or easy the training will be i think it you you probably as a during your design process you're not going to be thinking about that too much but what you're going to be doing is basically as you design as you co-create as you prototype you're capturing learnings yeah. that will then feed back into a more robust training plan so bringing the change um, uh, team if you have the luxury earlier in the process they're going to be exposed to that as well uh, of course there's there's a point in time that it's too early because you're changing too quickly yes but if the change team is there they're going to see for themselves what people were struggling with during the pilot and make sure that they can bridge that gap and that's really fantastic to um highlight this point um there's always um a bit of attention is that um um when do we bring the change professionals um and my sense of it and from my experience is that the earliest the possible earliest possible opportunity that the change practitioner will have a seat at the table uh, before it's too late um and you know if we meet all the one of the elements that you already mentioned in, in design thinking, which is about the empathy. Um, and uh, because the change practitioner will have a voice and will have some insight as well. And that insight can be about the culture, can be about the people, and can be about how developed the training program is to actually deliver uh, that. And so we can, we can design a very sophisticated process, but then the training will be far more complex. And if the training is going to be far more complex, there's high likelihood that the change will not be adopted fully. Yeah, a hundred percent. We at, um, at my current job, we uh, developing some new products that are focused more on the outside and outside clients. And in the squads that are reputing those MVPs, we have change professionals embedded um, inside, which is uh, amazing because they are seeing firsthand what technology is doing, what design is doing, but primarily what the customers, uh, the clients are saying. And they can build change impact plans and all of that straight away. Yeah, great. Um, where is the accountability for the design thinking team uh, with, the, with the process designers? Where is the accountability in terms of the change? Does it continue till the end of the change adoption process or does it stop at some stage and they move on to another process? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And I think I, I have a strong opinion on this that uh, I think that if you, especially in the reality that most organizations have, they don't have like a lot of resources mm. to do design and, and, and innovation. I think you have to bring the people that are going to own that product, that process as early as possible um, ideally start designing with them already. Of course, the most of the work will be done by the design team, but you need to free up time from the design team when the product has been validated, and let's say financially validated, uh, yeah, technology, uh, organizationally speaking, also have been validated. And primarily there's a desirability for that uh, new process from a client perspective. Yeah. Once you validated those three things, I think it's time for the design team, innovation team to move on to other things. Yes. Okay. Um, it, it, the reason why I ask this question is mainly because um, I really would like to see the design team stay along the journey and be connected to it because, because they can help solve problems because sometimes the prototypes is, are not going to give us all the insight and the flow on effect that we need. And that's why I think it will be really great for the process designers to stay in touch with the rollout. In fact, they should show a keen interest in how the rollout will eventuate, how the change will be managed. It's like, um, it's like a chef. Um, they don't only uh, make the meal, 
but they would like the type of plate that the meal will be served on. They would like, to, you know, the type of table. And, and so that, that piece, it's, it's a, a connected journey rather than I'm just making the meal and I'm going to leave it to the rest of the team to actually deliver it. Yeah, we have a, a very interesting um, framework that we use currently uh, at work. Uh, so I'm part of an innovation team. So we have, uh, let's say, innovation is in charge of that original design. So turning something from zero to one. So that idea, like we come we come into a space where we only have a problem. We create, uh, do a lot of research, develop some ideas, prototype those ideas. That's 90% innovation responsibility with an input from that future uh, product owner participating, making sure that the person is involved. We test that prototype with uh, a small number of uh, clients, uh, real clients, but not in a real world. And that the, the reason for this is that uh, our industry is highly regulated. Once we confirm desirability and that we're not causing any harm with the prototype, we move to a pilot stage. Innovation still leads that pilot stage. Yes, and that's a small cohort that are going to have that are going to experience that product as it is, uh, but it's still heavily controlled. Once we move and you graduate from that pilot to a bigger pilot, that's when innovation tr- changes its role from, uh, let's say, uh, leading to supporting. So, of course, we're going to be there supporting, and there's a lot of iterations that are going to happen. But suddenly from 90% involvement, we drop to, let's say, 30%. Yes. And then once you, re- once you launch, uh, it'll be like minimum involvement because the product is ready to go. Would you always recommend that, by the way, lots of people, some people talk it, you know, call it pilots, some people call it trials. Um, what do we call it? What's the best way to call things? I think it depends on what the organization is used to. I think there's some clear distinctions between what a prototype is. That is, it's, you know, the risk is really high. The pilot is already something, let's say a pilot for me is an MVP. It's a minimum viable product that yes. can be released out in the wild and can be used by your clients. Yes. Yeah. Customers. Yeah. And also, um, I actually hate the word trial because it gives the sense that if it doesn't work, we're not going to do it. Yeah. 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 And, and, um, and therefore, you know, plus of people actually show no interest at all or the awareness will not be there uh, for that. Um, this is great. Thank you. Um, during COVID-19 um, and, and, and during uncertain times, um, and, and we have a temporary mindset. In time of crisis, we usually go a short period of time. How does the process design work during those times? Yeah, I think that uh, there is a, um, one thing that was, you know, there's so many bad things about COVID, but one good thing is that I think organizations were more inclined to adopt change quickly. Uh, and of course, that uh, most of those cha- those changes, hopefully, you're never going to have to go back to them because COVID will never be there. But I think that what what happens with process design as a discipline is that you we have all learned that we can do things differently, mm. and we can all rally behind change when we have to. It's just a sense of urgency that is not going to be there. And I think that for process designers. Uh, the risk moving forward after COVID is the change fatigue and uh, that idea of, you know, a burning platform that yes. you know, we not all know when they talk about change management, how, you know, there's a lot of artificial burning platforms around uh, before COVID. Like how can you create a bur- an artificial burning platform after COVID? Like you're going to have to rely on really interesting strategies to rally people behind what you're doing post-COVID. Yes, yes. And I think, um, um, I really do believe that it's going to be hard for organizations over the next 12 to 24 months to talk about anything transformational um, because the majority of the workforce, they're really exhausted and tired. We've just come out, well, we're actually still going through it um, through uncertain times, and that takes a lot of energy out of us. Um, so I think organizations would need to think right now of process improvement and incremental improvement rather than a transformational program. I agree a hundred percent. And, and it's, um, I think it's, 
Interesting, because some organizations need a transformation now more than ever, mm. because what happened with their market, what happened with their clients, that uh, even internally sometimes, like uh, you don't have people in the office, so you need an internal transformation on your people strategy. Uh, I, I was reflecting on that the other day, and I, I even wrote an article talking about this idea of you know capturing hearts and minds. And I think this is now not a time to capture minds. It's a time to capture hearts. Because people are tired, but they still need to be engaged on, what, you know, the, the survival of the business they they work in. Yes, and so the notion of purpose and the why is is very critical right now, right? And it has to be honest. Yeah. Uh, after you know the the biggest event in our lifetime, how can you go back to your people and not be transparent about what's happening? Yes, the um, I mentioned that in um, in a different podcast. The Cotta Institute just released a report uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually, uh, three learnings out of COVID, and the first one was um, <clears throat> transparency and communication. They have become the expectations from people right now, and and so to your point around, it's going to have to be an honest why. Why do we need to do this right now? And um, and um, it's not going to go to uh, – there's a lot of debate right now. For example, uh, do we work – continue working from home or do we go back to the office or is it the hybrid? And lots of organizations that are just sitting in there trying to figure out um, what is the best way to do that. And but some organizations, the smart ones, they're already engaging with their people. And uh, because at the end of the day – um, you know, what COVID has uncovered is that you can work away from the office. You can, yeah, you can do all of those things. I mean, depending on, on, on the job. So, um, you know, uh, the fire brigade cannot work from home. And, uh, so, so, um, the honest why, um, is going to have to be really at the forefront of every leader's way of thinking. Um, when we test, so for from my experience, every time we have a change, especially in technology, we do lots of testing. And there's usually some organizations have got the luxury of having a testing team. Do we test? And so one of my challenges to those teams and from my experience is that they never check how people will feel about that change or how they just check that the process works from a functionality perspective. Yeah, it's such a fascinating um, conversation because at one stage it's like you have processes that are fundamentally technical yes. and you need to be very um, um, deliberate about testing technical aspects of yes. it. But on the other hand, most of the, the processes that you're changing and even um, uh, technologies that are introducing, they're going to change fundamentally how people work. And with, uh, I think that's where most of the opportunity lies in, in process design. It's not about the complexity. It's about listening to people and making sure that they're going to be comfortable in working in that future state, even if the change sometimes is not as big as what you're thinking making sure that you're going to get there, that you're going to get some results is, is the, the primary thing. I remember one uh, project that I, that I worked in. The key insight for us to find a problem space was the how unhappy people were in doing that task and making sure that we took that task away. Uh, it, it was such a simple thing, but in terms of results was like incredible because it just brought, uh, you know, a whole different side benefits in terms of like, I'm more motivated. My productivity will increase on doing other things. Of course, they're removing that task was a big thing. Yeah. But you're looking at people that can have a, a, a completely different approach to what they do, how they do their work. Yeah. And I think that going back to the design thinking framework, Ali, uh, we talk about all those three, uh, it's a Venn diagram with the three circles. You have desirability, uh, feasibility and viability. So desirability is, do people actually want that, that new process, that new product? Feasibility is, means, 
Can I do that in terms of organization and technology and viability is financial? Sometimes we start with viability and feasibility to then try to stack up if people actually like it. But you have to start with desirability first. And that doesn't change much either if you're creating a new app or if you're creating a redesigning your back of house uh, process. You've got to start with people. Right. Desirability, feasibility, and viability. I remember that, Fabio. Um, from your experience, and you work with a lot of change professionals, how would you rate the current change management capability um, for practitioners and also for leaders? Well, um, I think there's a lot that can still be done. I, I've met a lot of uh, change professionals that are, that are really at the forefront of, of change in terms of you know, learning new methodologies and, and, and really trying to understand the complexity of the world that they exist in. But I still see a lot of people that treat change as a transactional uh, activity, mm. as creating a PowerPoint, as creating a, a, a table of uh, before and after. I think that uh, with the, the change professionals that, are, that I've seen that have been more successful are the ones that are not interested on the, on the change discipline itself. They, get in, they embed themselves on what the product, what the process is to really understand it. They, they, they are not, uh, as I said, transactional. Mm -hmm. They're really uh, different. And I think in terms of leadership, uh, I haven't seen a, a big change. I think that I, um, I um, you know, have been very lucky to be part of a massive government transformation in the last three years where the leadership was... Uh, I have never seen anything like it, like how much they communicated, the transparency and everything they did. But I, I know that I'm lucky and I'm in a, in a different environment. Not many leaders are like this. But I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what, what, what's going to happen with COVID, uh, post-COVID, that people now see that change can happen like this yeah. and you know, how leaders are going to be reacting to that. Yeah, and one of the things that obviously um, COVID-19 uncovered is that all of a sudden leaders don't have all the answers and, and some of them always believe that they have all the answers um, and, and that was, that was going to be always the struggle. Um, uh, when, when we talk about change management, I think uh, your point around the transactional, um, the way I look at it is that Activity is going to have to be a purpose-driven activities and not a task-driven activities. And the second thing, if if it's uh, if change management is about people, then you got to have to think about that um, with all our activities and decisions that we actually make. And and we look at it as a holistic um, approach um, rather than we're just going to do bits in here. We're going to run training. In fact, some change managers are not even interested in training because these are training department. Um, and um, so I completely agree with you um, in terms of that. We've got a long way to go, but I think uh, I am noticing that there's a lot of um, change practitioners that are really keen to learn more. Um, and the way I look at it is that we need to think about, we need to learn more about training and new methodologies of training. We need to think more of how we communicate. Um, we need to educate ourselves in communication and then learning new ways to communicate. Um, um, we need to learn more about influence. Um, right? You know, you mentioned PowerPoint, mm -hmm. and I'm, by the way, I'm not against PowerPoints, but uh, we can put the before and after. But that's a whole story. You can't even put it in one slide. Um, and that's the whole you're gonna you're gonna go and change somebody's life, you know, and in and, and, and the office. Um, does that mean that we need to learn more about design thinking and and people centered design? A hundred percent. And I think that it's 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 people literacy skills that uh, need to come into into play. Some of the best change managers that I that I've met they come from HR 
It's yes. not a surprise that they, they are connected to people to speak in that language. But there's also a lot of other uh, tools that come with design thinking that are, that would be beneficial, like prototyping, for example, storytelling, that, you know, it's much bigger than, than just design thinking. But uh, being, mastering storytelling is one of the key skills that I think change professionals uh, could have. Yeah, because storytelling specifically helps us a lot around understanding the impact because that will give us a holistic view about the system and the process and where that particular process sits in the system. Yeah, and think about that that whole idea of starting early as a change professional. You're yes. part of a, you know, aware of a prototype, part of a pilot. You're capturing so many stories. When you go ahead and you want to roll that out to a much bigger audience, you can tell that story. You can, you can speak from the heart. You can speak from what happened, experiences. You can speak about pain points. You can be transparent. But if you're not there in the beginning, your storytelling would be very artificial. Of course, it would be better than, than just a, a table before and after. But if you're part of that process from the beginning, your uh, your repertoire for change like increases dramatically. Yes. If you come early in this stage, not only will help you understand um, – you know, at a deeper level, the why behind it, uh, but also it will help you articulate your key messages um, rather than, you know, it comes to you later. It will help you think early in the stage um, about how you're going to run training. It will help you early in the stage about where resistance will come from. Um, it will help you early in the stage about um, your, how sustainable or where your hypercare, whatever you want to call it, uh, period would look like. Um, so these are, these are the benefits that, you know, change managers will get. Um, and, and it's time, I think, for, for the change practitioners to talk to their uh, management teams and their sponsors about and educate them about the need of having a seat at the table. And perhaps they will be silent in the early stages because they want to listen to the whole thinking process. But when they talk later, to the teams, they will talk out of knowledge and, and it's informed knowledge of all the way from the initial stages to the implementation stage. Yeah, and, and the reality is that they're going to see problems that are very likely going to repeat in the future and they you know, will have the answers or at least they're going to be closer to an answer than coming in cold at the end. Yes, yes, yes. Fantastic. Um, and and so this this is really the the one of the questions that I wanted to ask you about is that how do organizations need to think of change management and um, and I'm hoping the listeners will um, will will be um, more more sort of willing to actually talk to their organizations, but I think I think I think there's a, a good awareness now uh, about the role of change managers again. Uh, uh, the crisis of COVID-19 has actually helped us really articulate our role. Um, but I'm a, a big advocate of um, we've got a critical role um, uh, working on people, um, it, on changes that impact people is, is a very complex process rather than, you know, um, we go from initiation to implementation to to um, sustainability or hypercare. Uh, it's not a linear process by any means. Yeah, exactly. I think that uh, this idea that uh, that you mentioned, like it's a, it, it is a complex problem. Every time that people are involved in change, it, it's not complicated. It's not simple. It's complex. And complex means that it will change. The problem changes as you try to solve it. So if you're not part of that problem, if you're not immersed in that problem, it's almost impossible to manage it from a distance, right? From, from your ha your desk in head office. It's going to be really hard. Fantastic. Uh, we we're coming to the end of the podcast, uh, Fabio. I really appreciate uh, your time. How would people reach you? Um, and I know that um, you're really keen on helping people uh, with their questions. Yeah, uh you can connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, Fabio Oliveira. Uh, there's, there's a lot of Fabio Oliveiras on LinkedIn, but if you look at Fabio Oliveira uh, WorkSafe, for example, which is where I work now, you, you're going to find me there. Uh, my website is fabio.so, so F A 
bio.so and you have all the links to my social media uh, stuff and, and email as well so you can um, reach me reach me there and we're going to put all your information on the podcast information as well i really appreciate the time it's been a pleasure my friend and then hope we talk soon take care Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode with Fabio Oliveira. To know more about this podcast, check the innergameofchange.com.au website. To receive more podcasts, simply subscribe. In our next podcast, we will meet with a learning and development specialist to explore the impact of capability building on change adoption. Until then, stay well and stay safe.